All right. So good morning, everybody, or good after, no, good morning. Good afternoon for us. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our uh, Wednesday Supportive Housing webinar. Um, uh, today's webinar is going to be hosted by myself and my colleague, John, and we're going to be talking about supportive housing in transitional settings and how to, how to prime people for success. I'm just going to read the title like it is, Dawn, because I love it. <laughs> Fine. Um, so as I said, welcome. Uh, today's webinar is hosted by DBHR through the Washington State Healthcare Authority. Uh, this is an interactive training. Um, we are in webinar mode, so you can't have your camera on, but please be on the lookout. Um, we're going to be asking questions. We do try to make things engaging. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat. Um, and the slides and the link to the recording of the webinar are going to be sent to everybody once the webinar has concluded. Um, I think you covered this. I think I did too. <laughs> if you are going to ask a question, um, I am just going to caution everybody to just be mindful of um, who you're sending it to. So you can just definitely send something privately to myself and Dawn, um, and that would be hosts and panelists. Uh, but if you want to send it to everyone, you have to make sure you click on the where it says two on the screen. I think it says um, everyone now, right? Yeah, it, now it says everyone. The language has changed a little bit, but you do want to just make sure you change that setting. And I think Dawn already uh, started the recording. Uh, so we are recording and let's just get to the learning objectives. Um, so today we're really gonna focus on defining psychiatric rehabilitation and trying to find the difference between psychology and psychiatry because psychiatric rehabilitation is inherently a little bit different. Um, we're also going to look specifically at uh, supportive housing which in Washington is FCS or Foundational Community Supports, um, and really focusing on the philosophy and services provided within FCS. Uh, we're then gonna talk about supportive housing services that can be provided or adapted for transitional living settings, because although it can be similar, the services that you're providing, the nature of transitional housing or transitional living is, is just different because it's transitional. And then we're going to describe ways in which transitional living staff providing supportive housing services can partner with community providers just to enhance the success of the individual they're working with and then reduce reinstitutionalization and future episodes of being unhoused. And I'll send it to you, Dawn. Thank you. Thank you. So um, if any of you have attended previous webinars, some of this may look familiar. We did a webinar that was probably a couple of years ago at this point, so um, maybe a different crowd of staff right now. But um, we did a we did a webinar around providing or starting to provide, introducing people to FCS or supportive housing services in um, in medical facilities, so in psychiatric inpatient facilities, a couple of years ago. So. Um, in essence, a lot of the skills or the interventions that were introduced are not drastically different. Um, but you will say, I just wanted to say that because you may see some similarities in this presentation to that one if you attended a couple years ago. Hopefully it will be a reinforcer if you did. Um, but we just want to start by just kind of grounding ourselves and starting from a common um, place in terms of our understanding of what psychiatric rehabilitation is and how psychiatric re rehabilitation really um, helps to frame a lot of the, the interventions, especially skills building, that are provided in supportive housing services, whether that be very early on in an institutional setting or in a transitional living setting, such as like an extended shelter or, you know, something similar to that. Um, even in an emergency shelter, we could begin to introduce some of the um, supportive housing, excuse me, concepts and begin to use some of the inter interventions, especially around building insight and skills. Um, and when I talk about building insight and then subsequently skills, what I'm mostly talking about is 
the insight that the individual has into the strengths that they currently possess and needs that they have to help kind of maximize their success in the community. So psychiatric rehabilitation are services that um, specifically aim to improve an individual's role. So their ability to fulfill what we call in the field of psychiatric rehabilitation, valued life roles or valued social roles. So things like being a parent, being a student, if an individual is like, you know, um, wants to go to school or is pursuing an education, higher education or vocational training, um, being a worker, right? So where do people place value in terms of their roles in society, in everyday life? I bet all of you could think of one or two roles that you fulfill that are extremely important to you. Many people who have children, you know, human, furry, <laughs> otherwise, maybe scaled, you know, might say being a parent, you know, or, you know, being a caretaker, or, you know, it, you know, for, for those of us who might be, have been in school for the last 30 plus years, it might be being a student. I don't know what to do outside of that role. So I'll be a teacher too, right? Because it's kind of similar. It's the flip side of that. <laughs> um, but like, we all have roles that we value. Um, it may be being a part of a, you know, community-based, you know, religious organization, being part of a congregation. It might be volunteering. It might be, you know, dancing. You might have that as a pastime. Whole slew of things. So what are those things that people value in terms of social roles that they either already have, wish to improve, or want to attain? So keep that thought in mind, you know, as, as um, you know, we're talking about you know, what role do people hold and, and kind of like cherish in their lives? And so one of our aims in psychiatric rehabilitation is to help them develop skills to better fulfill that role. So we also look at the functioning within an environment, whether it be their, the person's residence, places that they occupy, right? Like school or work or other areas in the community so that they can both thrive and recover. So we know that skills are best learned. We call it in vivo. So live and in the environment that the person's going to occupy. And this is why sometimes you don't see skills transfer so well from a hospital setting or even sometimes like a group living or group home type setting to independent living, because perhaps the individual individual wasn't provided the opportunity and the guided support to develop certain skills, whether they be cooking, you know, independently, um, whether they be self-management of medications, you know, think about when people are in hospitals or even sometimes in, you know, I know a, a group home that I worked in my first job in my career 25, 20, yeah, 25 years ago was in a group home and we locked all the meds up and we gave the meds to people at the appropriate time, right? Um, it didn't really help to build their skill set in managing their own medications. And this was a little bit pre- psych rehab really being prevalent, especially in residential services. So, you know, we were helping, but we weren't really teaching. <clears throat> so we want to be able to help bolster people's skills, you know, in the environment that they're going to be living in. So I would say that perhaps, I don't know if Emily agrees with me here. She's the therapist in the room, but I would say, so she could check me on this. Um, that psychiatric rehabilitation, where it differs, I think, the most from psychiatry and psychology. And, you know, knowing that psychiatry is mostly um, focused on kind of like the biological and the chemical mechanisms of a, of a uh, psychiatric condition. And so we prescribe medications that, or psychiatrists prescribe medications and they may offer recommendations on treatment. And psychiatrists and psychologists do talk therapy and work on, you know, kind of reframing thoughts and these types of things. And I think that where psychiatric rehabilitation differs is this, you know, real strong emphasis on skills building and also examining the person's, you know, kind of holistic life and where do they want to 
Where do they feel the best? Where do they want to put that energy? What do they want to improve? Much less focused on management of the psychiatric condition. What do you think, Emily? We want to add anything from a, just, from a clinician's perspective? Well, you know, I, I just want to comment that what I was thinking, the first word that came to my mind was holistic. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you said, right? And I think that's really what it is. I think psychiatric rehabilitation really looks at the individual as a person and all of the characteristics and facets of what being a being that person is yeah. um, and mm -hmm. focuses on supporting the person in their journey through that recovery process, as opposed to maybe psychiatry, which is more focused on, um, like you said, medication, uh, or maybe psychology, which is more focused on, you know, the brain and, and really thinking about some of those biological processes that are occurring in the brain. Um, I think psych rehab is more practical, right? Because we want to give, we want to teach skills. We want to provide the necessary supports to help to uh, get a person where they want to be and attain the goals that they have for themselves. And I think the only other thing to add, and this comes from from our colleague, Amy, who I, you know, I was pediatric rehabilitation, not as much for myself. Well, yeah, for myself. So I could explain it better to other people. And one of the things that I often forget is that psychiatric rehabilitation was really rooted in a social justice movement, um, <clears throat> late seventies, eighties, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of like the late seventies into the nineties. So, you know, and it's really, I think, you know, at the forefront today, um, there's a lot of advocacy that happens. And again, this, this idea, this goal that people will be able to fulfill their valued life roles, right? And that psychiatric, a psychiatric disorder should not hold them back. Psychiatric rehabilitation can also be utilized for people with any psychiatric condition, not just the things that we think of, like I always say the big three, and I don't say that like to make it big and scary, but the things that tend to, um, contribute to disability more often, uh, the psychiatric conditions, and those that tend to lead to hospitalization or homelessness, the most frequent. So disorders like schizophrenia <clears throat> or related psychotic disorders, bipolar disorder, and major depressive disorder, um, but it's not just limited to the use in those populations. Okay, so that was my big spiel on how great psych rehab is. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more about how great psych rehab is. So, um, psych rehab services uh, of which supportive housing is, is one, uh, focuses on building, enhancing or refining skills that are necessary for folks to improve their functioning in a variety of settings. So again, when I told you like, think about valued life roles, think about all those places where uh, you know, when you have any condition, whether it's, I was just lamenting to Amy, uh, sorry, Emily, I was just lamenting to Emily, not Amy. I was just lamenting to Emily that I have a torn, uh, torn labrum, which is something that's in your rotator cuff. It's extremely painful. I'm waiting to figure out if I'm going to have surgery or whatnot. And it threw me off today. Like I couldn't make my morning meeting because I didn't sleep well last night. And you know, I might stumble over my words a little bit in this training because I'm in pain, but like, so think about that, like think about those places and those roles that I have to occupy throughout my day as a mom, as a friend, as a teacher, you know, as a student, as a researcher, and how that condition can affect or limit me in those settings, right? And so when we're thinking about applying psychiatric rehabilitation services to people who have psychiatric conditions, it's kind of much, much of the same, right? Like how can those symptoms, maybe some of the deficits that might come along with it, maybe some cognitive impairment, how might that affect the individual in really thriving and flourishing in those spaces and places that they wish to occupy, right? And so that's why when we talk about goals in psychiatric rehabilitation and in supportive housing, we talk about things like overall rehabilitation goals, like the big picture goals that get people thinking and helping them to connect what they're currently experiencing to how that may inhibit them from flourishing in that role, right? So if my role is I want to be 
um, a tenured psychiatric rehabilitation uh, professor, which I do not want. That's too hard. Um, we have people in our department who want that. I do not want that, you know, but people who really want that, like, what are those things? What are those supports that I'm going to need because of this thing that I deal with, right? So um, we look at places like in the hospital, when people are hospitalized, how can we help them build their autonomy and start to practice skills while they're in the hospital? Being in the hospital is probably the most difficult place to practice um, those independent living skills or skills that are going to improve the individual's opportunity to thrive in the community. It's not to say that they can't happen, but it's very difficult because it's such a controlled environment. Work, school, and in the home. So um, psychiatric rehabilitation not only provides, you know, services such as, or, or is seen through services such as supportive housing, but you've probably also heard of other interventions that are psychiatric rehabilitation rooted, like supported employment, right? Um, and supported education. So these are other areas that use these skills in targeted um, kind of contexts or settings to improve people's um, ability to flourish and thrive. I just said that, so we're going to move on. All right, so let's talk about supportive housing. So many of you can probably add to this list. And if you do have other thoughts about what are the things that you know um, we help individuals with in, in supportive housing, please feel free to put it in the chat. I know I have some and some that are off the record as well. Um, Emily and I very frequently share stories of the, nobody told us that was gonna be in our job description when we, were, when we signed up to work in supportive housing because both of us have a background in supportive housing. But I have to tell you, it's probably one of the best learning environments to, to work in. Um, and, and probably one of the environments that allows you to spend the most time when you're not running from crisis to crisis with individuals and I think really help impact their lives in a positive way. So supportive housing services or FCS services are ongoing supports that, are, that help Medicaid eligible clients find and keep stable independent housing. So the types of services that are included are things like housing assessments, um, identifying resources that an individual desires and needs, to support them in the community, um, helping with, you know, actually obtaining housing and navigating the leasing process. And beyond that, actually understanding what the lease says in plain language, right? So I think that one of the things that supportive housing, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice keeps going out. One of the things that supportive housing staff um, have to get really hip to is legal language, especially around housing, which can be really difficult. Um, and in helping their, their individuals that they work with, their service recipients, understanding, you know, what are their responsibilities and what are landlord responsibilities in the lease. Um, uh, yes, mitigating landlord issues, tenant landlord tenant issues, helping with landlord relations. Um, Emily and I did a, a training a couple months back, I think, on um, communication. Um, it was specifically around, you know, when people fall off from communication, but we also talk a lot about having a, a solid communication plan with landlords um, to hopefully get ahead of major crises, at least major housing crises. So communicating with landlords, providing crisis management, and independent living skills development. So when we talk about independent living skills development, like we said, sometimes people will receive some training around living skills in a hospital, even sometimes in, you know, transitional living situations, <clears throat> excuse me. But until the person is in the environment they're going to live in, we're not going to necessarily know exactly where their skills are and, and, and where to kind of start training, retraining, right? Providing habilitation, because we have to remember that some individuals may have never ever learned independent living skills, especially if they transitioned from home or foster care right into the adult mental health system or homelessness. Very often there's this period of time that's really integral to learning these skills that folks miss. So, um, 
you know, one of my colleagues tells this really great story about how she worked with an individual in a group home to teach them how to cook. And then they got to their apartment and they had a small grease fire. And she's like, I don't understand how this happened. I taught you how to cook. Well, she taught him how to cook or her, I don't quite remember, on a on a um, electric stove in the group home. When they got to the apartment, they had a gas stove. Lucky them, I prefer gas stoves, but <laughs> I'm just saying, but they never learned how to cook on a gas stove. The open flame scared them. There was, you know, you know, luckily the apartment building didn't burn down, but they didn't learn in that environment. And so that's why like as your individuals transition from let's say like um, emergency housing services or transitional housing services or from institutions of care like hospitals or jail or prison settings, it's so important to reassess. Like, okay, I know you said you know how to cook, but look at this kitchen, <laughs> right? Do we know how to turn the stove on? Do we know how to cook? Oh yes, the showers in the hotel. I've scalded myself. I fro froze myself, or I've just stand there cursing at it for twenty minutes, and you know, called somebody else to turn it on. Absolutely. Yeah. So that that's a wonderful. Thank you, Emily. That's a wonderful um, um, analogy. So who is eligible for supportive housing? Or again, you know, in I, I'm just calling it generally supportive housing because that's the general intervention term. Folks call it different things in every state. We call it CSS in New Jersey. Y'all call it FCS. So we're just going to say supportive housing. Um, individuals experiencing chron chronic homelessness as defined by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development or HUD, like those folks um, are, are eligible folks who are dependent on costly and in institutional care. So again, individuals who are, I like, I, and I'm going to use this term languishing because my, my, uh, primary job is to be a consultant to the state hospitals here in New Jersey. So those individuals who are in <laughs> facilities like hospitals, um, who really no longer need to be there, right? You know, one of the standards across the country is that an individual is committed because they're a danger to themselves or others. There are very many people who sit in hospitals far beyond that, that period who are no longer a danger to themselves or others, but for lack of safe and affordable housing, they don't leave the institutions. Um, there's also a lot of other people who stay in institutions because of immigration issues and so on, legal issues, um, but but this is one, you know, one population um, because of lack of access to housing. Those that are dependent on more restrictive adult residential care or treatment settings. So think about folks who are in group homes or other kind of like residential services where there's like 24 seven on-site support that the individual may not necessarily need if they get housing with, you know, supports. Um, in-home care recipients with complex needs can also qualify. So there are things like med medically enhanced supportive housing where we can kind of wrap up services around an individual to prevent them from going to a residential health care facility, a nursing home level of care before they need to. Because a lot of people <clears throat> decline, can decline health-wise, um, both physically and mentally, if they're institutionalized before they really need it. And so we want to try and stave that off as well. And those that are at higher risks or highest risks of expensive care and negative outcomes. So a lot of the individuals that we serve have also, you know, not only a psychiatric condition, but also multiple uh, other physical health conditions, right? Like diabetes, cardiac disease, respiratory problems. <clears throat> perhaps, um, you know, uh, effects from substance use disorders, things like that. And so those that um, are in supportive housing or those that can benefit from supportive housing are also those with those really numerous um, negative health issues and um, expensive health outcomes. They're much better managed in uh, supportive housing type services. So supportive housing can be offered in multiple settings, and I don't have listed on here transitional housing, but that's one of them, right? So if a person is currently calling their residence, of course, it's not a permanent residence, but their residence a transitional living situation or emergency housing, then that is where services can, in fact, begin to be delivered. Um, you know, you may not 
be ready to take the person out on a housing search or sign a lease just yet. You may have just met an individual as somebody doing outreach to a shelter, but you can definitely start to use a couple tools that we're going to talk about um, in a couple of minutes here to begin kind of the conversation around, <clears throat> excuse me, what their needs and what their strengths are and what their desires for housing are. So why do we wanna start these services in a transitional setting? Well, let me throw that out to you guys. Why do you think that it might be beneficial to start using some of the supportive housing interventions? Um, granted, we haven't talked about them yet, but things like basic housing assessments, strengths and needs assessments, in a shelter type situation or a transitional living type situation. There's several benefits to it. There's one that I think is probably the best, um, but I'll see if y'all, if one of you say it. Yeah, so like early preparation, right? You're just getting the person starting to think. Um, individuals, may never been asked, you know, think about your ideal living situation and what would that look like? Or, you know, think about a time when you were living in the community and things were going well for you. What did that look like? Or think about a time when things weren't going so well, what was missing? Or what did your providers fail to do? Or what did you not do, you know, when that was happening? Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons why I think it's so important is that you begin to build a rapport with somebody, right? Like you will begin to find out from them as a person, what are the things that are important to them and how you can fit in their life to help support those goals. So in transitional settings, you know, transitional settings offer great opportunities or environments for individuals to start to identify their housing preferences. You know, like I understand that housing, there's housing shortages everywhere. We're not, we're not immune to that in New Jersey. Um, as I'm sure you are not in Washington, as I know you are not in Washington, um, but there are housing shortages everywhere. Housing is expensive. We're not always gonna get everything that we want when we rent or release or we buy a home. But we want to start to find out from people like, do you, do you wanna live um, in, a, in an apartment complex? Do you, would you rather live in a building with just a few apartments? Would you rather you know, um, uh, rent a studio because you're not sure that you can maintain the space of an apartment? Do you want to be on a bus route? Do you need to be on a bus route? I see we have a hand raised. Um, Natalie, would you like to speak? Let me find you. Oh, I don't see your hand up anymore, so never mind. Okay, no problem. Yeah, Kisha, like also that that you know encouragement. We're here with you. We're we're gonna we're gonna help you. It's big. It's scary. I mean, it can be really scary for someone to transition from homelessness to housing. Um, I've had individuals who would sleep on the floor. They wouldn't use their bed. I had individuals who would, you know, have all of their belongings in the living room with them, not unpack their belongings because of this, you know, they've been conditioned to have to move a lot from the spaces that they may have occupied um, in the streets or in, in, in other areas that weren't meant for human habitation, right? So like that ability to just relax <laughs> in a new environment can also be really difficult, right? And if a person has spent a lot of time unhoused, they, have, they may have developed a whole slew, I'm sure they've developed a whole slew of skills to keep them as safe as possible, right? And so now it's like they have to kind of transition and, and, and learn a new tool, set of skills. Um, excuse me. Providing supportive housing in this setting also provides hope to the individuals from others that recovery is possible. So as one of the, the participants said earlier, like I, I've got you, we're gonna do this together. And I believe that you can recover and that you can thrive outside of this environment. Not only does it do that for them, it does that for the other people who, who see them move on, right? So I think that starting this conversation with people who are ready and able 
to have this conversation about talking about future housing and the skills that they might need to acquire also sets an example for the other people in these types of settings that we're not expected to be here forever and that we can and will move on. Um, and so, and, and my favorite aspect of starting these, any conversation in an earl, at an earlier point in time is that you begin to build trust and a therapeutic rapport. Um, and one of the things that folks say almost in pretty much any sector or line of behavioral health services is they rate the quality of the services they provide on how good of a relationship they felt that they had with the provider of those services, right? So folks feel that they benefited the most from the providers who they had the best therapeutic rapport with, the, the you know, healthy boundaries, a, a, a nice level of trust. Those are the folks that, you know, um, service recipients report as helping them the most. And so it's about being genuine and, 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 ni and nice, be nice, honest, and, you know, challenge folks. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me, some sample tools and interventions that can be used in transitional settings with individuals um, one thing that we adapted at Rutgers for use in our state psychiatric hospital um, was, it, it's called Tools for Moving On, but it was based on a free SAMHSA guidance in a toolkit. And I'm not sure that that toolkit is still out there because SAMHSA has recently kind of reconfigured their website and it's pretty awful. Um, and it's pretty hard to find a lot of resources. Um, but we will send along the tools for moving on manual. Again, remembering it was designed for use inside New Jersey state psychiatric hospitals. So you'll see a lot of New Jersey language. It's not like yo and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but I mean, like New Jersey language as in, you know, specific to our housing options and our rules in our hospitals and how things happen. Um, but also it will be, you know, kind of geared towards an inpatient, you know, service recipient. But you can absolutely use a lot of the worksheets in it and tools and interventions in it for individuals that you might be meeting with who are transitioning to housing from other non inpatient settings. So just just wanted to give you that caveat. So it's based on something called tools for tenants and we call it tools for moving on. So we'll show you some samples from that today. Um, illness management and recovery, which is also you can obtain IMR, the IMR manual for free from SAMHSA. There's a more recent version from Hazleton, the Hazleton Center, but that one is copyrighted and you have to pay for it. Um, but you, I think that you can still get the older um, edition from SAMHSA for free. And that has a lot of guidance. I think Il IMR is something like 14 modules, something like that, um, on everything from, you know, um, um, diagnosis education. So education on what an individual's diagnosis may be to provide, you know, some information on um, common symptoms, common, you know, interventions that have been proven to be effective to um, medication, self-management, to goal exploration. There's just so much in it that helps to teach individuals with, seri uh, with psychiatric conditions how to manage their condition and recover. We can provide nutritional education. That's also in IMR guidance on things like grocery shopping, bill paying. I don't know why I stopped at grocery shopping, but basic budgeting skills, basic financial management skills that Unfortunately, not even kids tend to get in, in high school anymore. That was like the one great thing about home ec class, baking cookies and learning how to make a budget. Um, but folks don't get these skills anymore. Even folks who don't have a psychiatric condition and you know um, are moving on to independent housing. Um, and like I said, financial education, conflict management skills. So some of the goals, I need to move my little bar because I can't see things, All right? So when we talk about 
Um, the one, the one intervention that we're going to talk the most about is tools for moving on, which is based on tools for tenants. Um, and the goals of that is to help individual explore housing choices in the community. Like what are the housing options out there? So if you're going to use our manual, which again talks about New Jersey options, you're just going to want to kind of replace those options with what's out there and available in Washington. Um, I'm going to guess fairly similar, but you may have some, some spe specific nuances that are different. Identifying housing rights and responsibilities. So this curriculum goes through what the landlord responsibilities are, what tenant responsibilities are, what your, your um, rights are um, under uh, the Civil Rights Act also. Explore and, and, and discover what is important for a person in their housing choice. So like I talked about earlier, right? Do I want to be on a on a public transportation route because I don't have a vehicle? Um, do I want to be near a grocery store? Do I want to be near stores so I can walk to them? Do I want to be near my house of worship? Right. Um, these types of things may be really important to people. Learn skills that will help them live independently and help to identify those supports that are needed for successful community living. So here's an example of one intervention that we use. Um, this is actually like straight from Tools for Tenants. We made it pretty and did a lot of nice stuff for it in our version. So you use our version, but this is also out there um, available from SAMHSA. One of the things that you can begin to do with people is to explore what are the skills that they have and what are the skills that they need or feel that they need? And again, this is self-report, right? If you have your own observations or if you have some history about the person that might contrast with what they say, like maybe the set person says, I have skills in every single one of these areas, but they've never, ever, ever been able to maintain their housing, right? That might be an opportunity for more conversation, right? So um, if it's things like, you know, you know that the person has chosen to stop their medication multiple times, and perhaps that led to a relapse of their psychiatric symptoms, and they ended up in the hospital or maybe unable to meet their, their responsibilities as a tenant, and they ended up homeless, you might want to hone in on this mental health services section and say, well, you know, I understand that you've, you've, you've chosen to stop your medication several times. You know, tell me more about that. What led up to that? You know, very often people stop their medications um, because of side effects. Um, doctors don't always do the best at talking to people about side effects. Um, and also there is this condition that individuals, especially with psychotic disorders like schizophrenia may have called anosognosia, where there is a complete lack of realization that the person themselves has this psychiatric condition that they, you know, that treatment would benefit them um, and that treatment would benefit them. So also understanding that some individuals may, you know, if you followed any of our trainings in multiple uh, or in um, motivational interviewing and you, you know what pre-contemplation is where a person isn't really even aware that they have a problem that they need to work in, Anosognosia is kind of like pre-pre-pre-contemplation. It's this complete inability to recognize that one has a condition, right? So again, using this checklist to have the person think about what skill sets they have and what skill sets they need. One of the best ways to do this is to ask about, you know, when things were going well at any point when you've lived on your own or even when you've lived with others, what was working? Um, and ask them also if they're having a difficult time kind of going through the list like this, what didn't go well or what went wrong when you came back to the hospital or you ended up unhoused or incarcerated? What were the things that weren't in place for you? And what we do with individuals is once they work through this, this skills kind of checklist is ask, you know, well, how can we, how can the individuals that you're working with, whether here in your current setting or once you transition to the community, what are the things that you're going to need help with in maximizing your ability to thrive in the community? 
and to fulfill your valued social roles that you strive to occupy, right? If you want to be more present in your child's life and you haven't been able to do that for the last few years because you've been struggling with maybe an addiction or maybe maybe a substance use disorder, maybe, you know, a um, mental health um, uh, uh, situation, maybe, you know, unemployment, like what are the things that you're going to need so that we help you occupy that role as parent, as strong parent? Um, staff, you know, we also want to make people aware of how staff can help them. So help with finding housing, help with applying for housing, help with getting settled, right? Help with keeping the housing so that individuals know that when they transition to supportive housing, it's not just, I, I say, but in bed, right? And then our job is done, right? You're, you're in the housing, that means you're integrated, all good. No, like community integration isn't just occupying a residence. It's also, you know, that individual being connected to the resources and the supports in the community that they want to be connected with, the services and activities, leisure activities, a variety of things that they want to be connected with and engaging with. So it's also about helping individuals kind of like maximize that living situation and where they're at. Okay. So we have the, I just showed you the skills checklist, the have and don't have the skills where we begin to identify what are those skills pretty specific to community living that an individual needs to be taught or, or further develop. And this check sheet or rating sheet, it's a couple pages long, just giving you a snapshot, is about housing preferences. So, you know, would you like to live in a house? Would you like to live in an apartment? You know, getting that conversation started, again, knowing that housing is limited and that you're not going to be able to necessarily meet every single need or I shouldn't say need, desire that an individual has. You know, I live in an apartment, my apartment's okay. What I don't like is I don't have laundry facilities inside my apartment, right? Like, so not everybody's living situation is going to be perfect, but you're going to try to find the one that best meets your needs. But also keeping the these sheets, retaining them and keeping them in mind and revisiting them when an individual has achieved, you know, a period of stability. Maybe there comes a time when an individual begins to work. They have, you know, they, they have a little bit more breathing room in their income, in their budget. And maybe they do start to think about, you know, this apartment was, was okay for me to get off the streets or to get out of the hospital or to get out of the correction setting. But I think I, I would feel more fulfilled if I had something different or had something more. So, you know, one of the things that I often say to people, or not anymore, but in the past when I was a service provider and I would come into hospitals and interview folks, I would be blunt with them and tell them and show them pictures and take them on day passes to see the housing that we had available and also say, I don't expect you, I don't expect this to be your last stop, right? Just like I don't expect you to go to a day program or partial care your entire life and make a career out of that. I don't expect this living situation to be your last stop if you don't want it to be, right? So we always wanna keep that door open um, that individuals should think about what they want and what they strive for, because that makes for really great goals um, that we can utilize down the road. So if you just look at this, it asks, it, it asks different types of questions and to get into it further about things like, would you like to live on a public transportation route? Would you like to live close to a house of worship? Like these kinds of things. Would you like to live in a rural or urban? And I guess in in Washington, it would be frontier environment, right? We ask all of those questions. Um, and then we ask the person to, to tell us like, well, what is your ideal housing goal? And it's okay if they say, I want to own my own house. And you know that that realistically isn't possible for them at that time. That's okay. That's okay. It's just like when we're, we're talking about um, the development of a recovery plan or treatment plan, if a person says, I really strive to be the president of the United States, and you know that the person hasn't graduated college yet, maybe their you know, reading proficiency might be, might be um, low, um, 
maybe they have a really difficult time in social situations. I mean, we have some presidents that have had difficult times in social situations. So I don't think that disbars or disqualifies a person. But when you know, oh gosh, like the odds are stacked against this person, it's okay. Like let them have this goal because I frequently, you can ask them at a later time, what is it about that living situation? Or what is it about that big aspirational goal to be president that is appealing to you? Right. So, and then we ask them to have like, well, what's your second goal or what's your, what's your second choice? Right. And it might be, well, I'll suck it up and I'll live in an apartment for a while if I have to. Right. So we want to ask them, like, I understand, like, you might not be able to get your ideal living situation right now, but what would be your ideal living situation? And that's also important because sometimes there are elements of that ideal living situation that one can bring into where they're actual where they're actually living. So one of the things that I loved when I lived in a house was having a garden that I could grow herbs and tomatoes. I had to have my herbs and tomatoes. Everybody in New Jersey grows herbs and tomatoes. I needed to do it. I'm in an apartment and I was like, wow, I really can't do that, but I have a balcony. This year I didn't do it because it was too ungodly hot, but last year I grew beautiful tomatoes and basil and cilantro and all that fun stuff. So like there are ways, right, to incorporate those things that the person desires out of that ideal situation to make where they're at a little bit more comfortable. We also want to find out what are the things that are most important to the person in housing? Is it quiet? Then they wouldn't live in my apartment complex. I'm telling you that much. Um, is it, again, like I said, living in a place where they see a lot of green, right? That could be very therapeutic. Living in a place where they can have their pet. If I didn't have my kitty cat, I'd feel awfully alone, right? So like those types of things. Emily, do you have anything to add? Because I need to take a sip. <laughs> yeah, so I would also just add that um, you might even be surprised uh, something that happens a lot here in New Jersey is that sometimes individuals have to make a choice to live someplace that is not their ideal. Um, and may not even, the, may not even be the region of the state that they're, they were living in prior to being. Right. Yeah. right. And I've seen that work both ways. I've seen it work in the way that the individual was miserable and, you know, we ended up having to support them and finding housing in the county in which they really wanted to live in. Um, but I've also seen that happen where, you know, the, maybe the client lived in a more um, like urban setting here in New Jersey and then moved to an area that was less urban and maybe a little bit more rural because we do have very rural places in New Jersey and they actually really liked it. Um, so sometimes just, you know, going through that experience can also help to give the person information. And, you know, if you have the ability to, you know, take the client or take the consumer to the town, walk around the town, go to where the parks are, go to where, you know, the apartment building might be and just stay there for a little bit, you know, spend like a, you know, 30, 45 minutes there and just see what the person thinks of it and what some of their impressions are, that could also be helpful in exploring this process because sometimes we end up liking things we didn't think we would. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, you know, I often made the assumption when I was interviewing potential supportive housing um, clients in the hospital that, oh, wow, you, you, that I, I went to the, the, the hospital that I would consult with was in, our, in the southern region of our state. And so Atlantic City sent a lot of people to the psychiatric hospital. But Atlantic City is a place where people come to from all over the state, the tri-state area, all over the country, sometimes internationally, which I don't understand, but a lot of people come here. So they may have originated from Essex County, which is bordering with New York City, right? That's where Newark is in northern New Jersey. And I would assume, oh, you want to go back to Essex County because that was your home. And sometimes they say, no, absolutely not, because I want to get away from people, places, and things also. So, you know, and but also knowing that people can find people, places, and things anywhere, you know, sometimes it does offer that opportunity for like this fresh start or maybe like that environment that they never knew they needed. Like you said, Emily, like 
folks may have never realized because they grew up in the city that they would really flourish in a suburban area or a more rural area. All right, so thank you for saying that. Also in Tools for Moving On, we talk about finding community supports outside of just, you know, whoever their supportive housing worker is that they see the most. Here we listed as case manager. But like, you know, outside of supportive housing, outside of formal mental health services or, or um, uh, substance dependency services, like outside of that, that realm. We want people to be able to build up their community supports, right? So does that mean, you know, you need help with meeting new people? You know, not everybody has a huge support system. Some people are lucky to have one or two or three really, really great friends, right, that can support them, but not everybody has that. So we want to start to assess, like, what does the person's support network look like? Um, because, I think that very often there is, I don't know about in Washington, I'm going to guess that this um, this assumption, this false assumption does um, occur in Washington, as well as here in New Jersey. Very often people will be referred to supportive housing and the referring provider assumes that supportive housing means you're gonna do for the person 24 seven and make sure they do everything they need to do to stay in their housing, to, to continue with psychiatric treatment, um, you know, substance use treatment, and so on and so on and so on. And we know as providers of supportive housing, that is not the case. We are not magicians. We are not warlocks as much as we would like to be. <laughs> we do not have magic wands, right? And the idea of supportive housing is that the person is there voluntarily. We cannot force psychiatric services. You know, obviously, if a person is a danger to self or others, we may call, you know, emergency services or screening or try to have some kind of outreach intervention. But treatment services are still optional in the, in the supportive housing, the permanent supportive housing model. And so it's really important that we try to like maximize an, a person's support network because there may be times an individual says that they don't want to talk to their supportive housing staff person. There are times where they may just be sick of us. There are times where an individual may be having a bad day. Um, we want to make sure that there's more than just us in terms of supports that the individual can reach out to to get some of, to get their needs met. Um, because sometimes it's just a sense of uh, an, a situation of an individual finding more comfort at a drop-in center, at a wellness center. Um, you know, working with peers who have been there, done that, lived through this, uh, not to quote a whole album, but they've lived through that, right? And so finding some comfort and com camaraderie with individuals like that. So we really want to, you know, build all these different kind of tentacles that the person can use to reach out to those supports. And that can start in a transitional setting, right? And kind of one of the last um, exercises that we do in Tools for Moving On is to ask people to like kind of think about their supporters as like this circle of support. So obviously they can put you in there as, as case manager, as a housing specialist, as an outreach, as a peer supporter, whatever role you're fulfilling. And I, I use all those words because very often in supportive housing, we're wearing lots and lots and lots of hats. Um, but to identify like who are the folks that you have in your life right now? What are the supports that you believe would help you keep your housing once you attain it? And fill those all in so the individual knows. And, and it could be great to like also list for maybe individuals that aren't family or friends that they may not have like the quickest um, contact information for, you know, fill in contact numbers. So the individual has people that they can call. Um, one of the things that individuals leaving the psychiatric hospitals in New Jersey started doing is once they completed the tools for moving on manual, because they would be filling in their work along the way, and this is delivered in a group format, um, it's a group curriculum inside the New Jersey State Psychiatric Hospitals, um, but some social workers were also doing it with folks one-on-one, -on -one. folks who maybe couldn't tolerate the group environment, um, or had medical issues that precluded them from going to the groups. 
Um, they also use this, you know, booklet one on one with individuals and then the individual when they would have a housing interview with a prospective housing provider from our uh, C uh, CSS programs or community support service programs, they would take this booklet that they then put together and are able to say, these are my strengths. These are the type of needs that I'm going to have and I'm, I'm going to need you to help me work on, right? Um, these are the supporters that I have. And these are the other ways that I think I need to be supported because when I was in housing the last time, it didn't work out so well and here's how, right? So it also, it does like a, it's a double benefit. It's a benefit for the individual who's being served because it's getting them to kind of look inward and gain some insight into their strengths and their needs and their preferences. But also it's going to help that provider of services, which may or may not be you moving forward, whether you follow that person into the community or not, but it would be a great handoff for that next provider of services to have a snapshot of what the person's housing needs and preferences are. It really, really helps. We got feedback here in New Jersey that it helps with the initial treatment plan or recovery plan, we call it here in New Jersey, the IRP. It helps the folks filling those out because they have this input already from the individual. And so it's really great, you know, in terms of allowing the individual to have a voice in what they're going to need from that next provider. And we always want to encourage that the individual having a voice in the room and shared decision-making. So let's talk briefly about illness management and recovery. Again, that is another free resource that is available from SAMHSA. Um, hopefully it's still up and available, um, <clears throat> but it is a like a 14 module manual. Um, and I may be fibbing a little bit on that number, but I know because like we developed a couple new ones for use in our hospitals um, here because they don't talk too much about things like PTSD. And we added some information on PTSD, trauma, um, but it covers a wide range of topics targeted at improving knowledge in the individual who is receiving services. So providing them with knowledge and, and, and insight and also, you know, getting them to identify um, ways in which they can better self-manage the psychiatric condition, the substance use condition that they may be living with. So we talk about the role of medication in managing symptoms, um, identifying and dealing with side effects, making informed decisions about medication, and getting the best results from medication. And this is specifically from the one module called Behavioral Tailoring for Medication. It's a very, fairly short module, but it's a really good idea to start talking to people who are in either, you know, any kind of institutional setting, especially those settings where their medications are being managed or partially managed for them um, about, do you know what medications you're taking? Can you identify them by sight? Do you know what each of them are supposed to do for you? Do they do that for you, right? Because I think that um, a lot of people become like passive participants in psychiatric services at times, right? And so we want people to be able to identify whether or not medications are actually helping them. Um, finding out if individuals have side effects, letting them know what the common side effects are. And please do not leave out, as someone who teaches about sexual health, please do not leave out sexual dysfunction because um, even among individuals who are over the age of 65, Sexual dysfunction is the number one reason why they stop taking antidepressants. It's very rarely discussed with recipients who are being prescribed medications, unfortunately. And then it, then it takes the person by surprise and they don't know what to do about it. And there's a fair amount of shame in our culture around you know, sexual activity. And so they may be scared to even talk or feel shame in talking to their doctor about them. So I'm not saying you lead with what the sexual side effects are going to be if, if it's the first time that you talk to the person, but making them aware that this is one of many types of side effects and it can be fixed, helped, right? With some tweaks to medication and possibly the addition of other medications. Um, 
so we talk, we, we really like to have individuals start to think about their medication while they're in a more restrictive setting where their medications may be in control because we don't know what that's going to look like once they get into supportive housing. Um, I know there's different models of supportive housing out there. The one that I worked in, we really walked the line of doing things legally versus <laughs> illegally by locking people's medications up and then taking them out to them, um, either at every medication administration time or some people got meds every three days. Um, but it's you're walking this really fine line and putting people who aren't medical staff into some really kind of sketchy roles. And so we really wanna to start to you know um, see how can we help the person self-manage their medications if they've never done that before, or if they've had challenges with doing that before. So if you're going to use something from IMR, I would definitely recommend this module because it will help you get to know where that person is in their understanding of what medications they're taking, their um, kind of agreement with the medications that they're prescribed and what side effects they may have and what challenges you may, you may see in the person being able to continue to you know, take their meds as prescribed um, in the community. That may also, you know, talking about medication may also clue you into whether the person has that. We talked about that condition or symptom of psychotic disorders called anisognosia. You know, people will sometimes say things like, they put me on this medication in the hospital or in the jail or in the emergency room, but I don't need it. And as soon as I get out of here, I'm going to stop taking it. There's your sign, <laughs> right? So you want to have a little bit more conversation around that. Um, a medication is, is, is their right, right? They, they could choose to take it or to not take it, but at least it provides you with some insight of where the person is. Um, so we also want to, and this is, this is especially important if you're not going to be the person that's going to follow the, the individual into the community, you want to start to, you know, partner, or provide opportunities for the individual that you're working with to meet that housing provider, to meet that FCS provider in the community that may follow them more long-term, right? So, you know, there may be opportunities for to take the person on a visit. There may be opportunities to bring staff to the facility. If you're that person, or if you're going to at least follow the person into the community and then do a warm handoff to, you know, another more permanent worker in the community, then that's great. Um, but it provides a great kind of segue or transition into the community that's supported rather than very abrupt. Another thing that we have to think about um, with individuals who are transitioning from, you know, unhoused situations or um, uh, um, correction settings or hospital settings, sorry, lost my train of thought, is that people have been traumatized throughout our system, right? Not only have they probably experienced early childhood trauma or adverse life events, you know, throughout their life, which probably contributed to their current life circumstances and their psychiatric condition and any substance use disorders, but the system can also be traumatic. And so things like forming relationships with a clinician who you really feel supported by and you feel like you're starting to make some progress and then the person leaves, right? I know I've had that happen to me in therapy. I've had three or four therapists move on and I'm happy for them. They moved on to bigger and better things, but it's like, wow, you really feel let down and a little traumatized because if you're someone who has like, has experienced that feeling of being let down or abandoned multiple times in your life, that can really be traumatic and be a setback. And so one of the things that we've heard from the individuals that are discharged from the state hospitals in New Jersey is word for word, this is what many people said, I went from having 24 seven support or just the knowledge that someone was there if I needed them to nothing, right? Now I worked in supportive housing. I know there's not nothing, I know that there's a safety net. I know that we had a 24 hour hotline. We would be there if the person needed us, but it was that feeling of when I was in the hospital or even in the correction setting, there were people around me and now there's nothing, right? 
Um, just kind of that feeling of abandonment being left out there. And we need to understand that like a transition into housing, albeit happy and positive, can be incredibly stressful, incredibly stressful. Any, you know, positive life events can be really stressful. You know, think about having a baby, right? Wonderful, exciting, but I don't know about any of you. I've, I've had a baby and I've had many, oh crap moments. Like, was I really ready to do this, right? So even positive life events can bring stress. And so we want to make sure people feel supported during that transition. Okay. And so we're kind of coming to the end. It's a little early, but I'm going to go ahead and just trudge through with where we are. Um, if anybody is interested, if you're not already a foundational community support provider, um, you can contact Washington DBHR for more information on regulation policies, reimbursement, all that kind of fun nitty gritty stuff that Emily and I would have no idea about um, in, in, in Washington anyway. Uh, for more information. And additionally, um, you know, we wanted to say like, these are the goals of FCS um, and supportive housing in general, which are, you know, not only are they, are they valuable to the individual, um, they're actually a really valuable and cost-saving option for the state, you know, Division of Behavioral Health. Um, you probably, I don't know if many of you have seen the figures of institutional care and even transitional living, you know, rates. And people don't receive that many rehabilitative services in those levels of care because of the sheer volume of individuals that are in it and the lack of, you know, professional staff that are working in those environments. So supportive housing or FCS really provides a really great clinical bang for the buck. Um, for individuals and for systems of care. That's not to say like, hey, we're looking for the cheapest way out to serve people, but it's really like, it's good services at a really affordable rate. And this is why you've seen this start to really um, take hold in a lot of states in terms of supportive housing spreading. The services can be integrated into the person's, you know, therapeutic interventions that they're already being provided. So if the person is receiving services, if they're seeing a therapist, if they're participating in groups, if they're, you know, going to self-help support groups like AA, NA, this is a great way to also integrate, you know, um, housing services or housing skills services in addition to those more clinical services that are also being provided. And the clinical and the skills development around independent living are going to intersect, um, definitely intersect. Um, and it really is, a, is um, a, a great strategy for an individual to be having those needs met from multiple angles, right? So not just psychology and psychiatry, but also psychiatric rehabilitation to work on the skills. And one of probably the, the most important things that supportive housing or FCS does is communicate that recovery is possible for everyone, despite the presence of psychiatric symptoms. So just to kind of like add on and to explain that, that point a little bit more, um, one of the studies that I participated in in the last couple of years, which was with people receiving assertive community treatment, um, which are folks that typically have had repeated visits in um, psychiatric inpatient long-term institutions um, and have demonstrated an inability or real, real difficulty with maintaining um, independent living. It's kind of a step up from supportive housing in terms of intensity of care. Um, so folks have pretty have had pretty significant hospitalization histories and may continue to have significant psychiatric symptoms. One of the things that precluded them or precluded them from entering the workforce and entering um, educational further education was not the presence of psychiatric symptoms. It was the adoption of an illness identity. And so that is, you know, believing that I am my illness and my illness limits me, right? Individuals who still had profound psychiatric symptoms were more likely to be able to work if they didn't identify that illness identity. Individuals who identified the illness identity who didn't have psychiatric symptoms were less likely to work. So I say that to say that communicating that hope and trying to really mitigate stigma that people feel and, and internalize is so important and such a huge part of what you do in supportive housing. 
So that is the end of the presentation for today. We want to open it up to see if anybody has any questions or comments or stories or advice they'd like to offer other people or experience working in settings other than a residential type supportive housing setting and trying to utilize these types of interventions. Has anybody tried that yet? And what has your experience been? Yes, we will send that TFMO resource along. I'll also see if I can find a link or the free IMR manual um, on I put, What's I put that? that? I put that in the chat already. Oh, thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll be happy to hear that the um, supportive housing manual is back up on the SAMHSA website. Oh, yay. It was so bizarre. So everybody, if you don't know, SAMHSA usually, um, they have always had toolkits and they were called evidence-based practice toolkits. So if you wanted to start a supportive housing program, you have um, a toolkit. they're going to expect you to do it the right way, right? If you want to be reimbursed. <laughs> well, about a month or two ago, they took down all their evidence-based toolkits because they said they weren't up to date enough. Hmm. Nobody had anything. So that was interesting. So it's great to know they have some stuff back up. Yeah. So in the chat is the link specifically to the tool, tools for tenants portion of the toolkit for um, supportive housing. And then the link for the IMR in its entirety. I'm also going to put a link to um, my group, people that I work with the most. I don't know what to say. I work for the department, but most of my time is spent in the state hospital project. Um, I'm going to put a link to our website because it has a lot of cool uh, training resources on it that are free of charge. You can sign up for um, monthly, we call them prep webinars, which are psychiatric rehabilitation educational programs. We love acronyms. We love them in the mental health field, don't we? <laughs> um, but they are open to everyone. We initially started them just for the state psychiatric hospital staff in New Jersey. Then we recently expanded it nationally to uh, state hospitals across the country. And now we're just kind of welcoming everybody because we just wanted to test it out small scale before we opened it up to everyone. But those are also available. The mental health field does like... Uh acronyms done, but not as much as Tom. No. My whole first year in the in the field was spent learning acronyms. Mm -hmm. So if anyone in last call for comments, requests, um, and I guess we could take this opportunity to say if you have any ideas for future webinars that you may want to see. You know, we're asked sometimes to recycle some of our webinars because as you know, there's a lot of turnover in the field. Um, please feel free to shoot us an email. Our emails are on the, um, the slide deck that you'll receive. Please like shoot us, you know, say like we're, we're struggling with this, this topic in Washington right now. Do you have any um, information on that? And we'll try our best to deliver. If not Emily and I, then somebody in our in our um, area that has skills and expertise in it. I see Angela raised her hand. Would you like to talk, Angela? Yeah, my, my um, what I'd like to learn more about, because in our area and in my, my career, I have worked closely alongside the chronically homeless. And when I say chronically homeless, I mean, 30 years plus, okay. you know, and, yeah. and not all of them are what you would think is uh, um, the degree of mental health. I mean, of course, the mental health is yeah. always there, rather, they like to even recognize it. But sure. to how to, I mean, it seems like it is a, a area that is so diverse, and so complex, that of course, it's going to be different with everyone. But the residual effects of just like, you know, I figure after one year of homelessness, you're chronically homeless or consider chronically yeah. homeless. Yeah. And the different degrees of, I mean, pulling or not pulling them, but guiding them out of that. You know, um, I have seen um, a lot of people, it's just a very difficult area to deal with. It's difficult to do as a staff person, right? 
Uh, yeah, well, difficult for all of us, but um, I mean, just when I, my last job working with the chronically homeless, I always make the joke, I was kind of jumped in, you know, like it was a gang that I didn't understand. And I wasn't looked at as belonged there, you know, or, or had, a, you know, had or deserved a part of it because they become a family and, um, and well integrated part of society. And um, it's just so, everybody's so different. And the, the rules and the places that we go or I work or have to deal with them change with the entity that I'm working for or the area, the county, the, yeah. the city. Mm -hmm. It's just so, I don't think that us as a society has really gotten a grip on what to do. And uh, our area, we deal with a lot, a lot of chronically homeless. And I believe our politicians, should I say that? aren't quite ready to recognize the chronic yeah. homelessness. I mean, they will say, okay, they're chronically homeless. Okay. And they want to sweep them off to the side um, and not really want to focus on it, or they don't even have a clue yeah. the diverse complexities of this. So I would love a webinar on just, you know, the, just pulling like five of the complexities would be nice and like, like how the, to deal with them yeah like engagement strategies for chronically yeah, yeah and I, I I wholeheartedly agree I think mm -hmm. even, you know here in New Jersey as well I think that you know people just people in charge I'll say <laughs> you know of making decisions very often think well we made housing available right like yeah the people just accepting it you know and it's like you said when you touch on like people have created families they've created communities they've created cultures you mm -hmm. know uh, while being unhoused um because you have to right to survive you have to do that and and people naturally do that um and probably if any one of us were in that situation we would and yeah but it creates such a difficult um way in for those of us who yeah. want to um, and so like one of the things here in New Jersey that one of the <laughs> most successful things that I found was like partnering with other organizations who already kind of have their foot in the door. We have a, I, I live in Burlington County in New Jersey, which is a fair like, suburban, but the, we have some real rural areas because the Pine Barrens are also in our county. And I would partner with a Christian organization that was located in the Pine Barrens to literally this this pastor would go out into the woods and bring her backpack of food and bring toiletries and you know things like single use right. toothbrushes and things like that mm -hmm. but it still took me about 6 months for anyone to talk to me yeah. like the unhoused individuals were out who were out there because they didn't trust me right, right. Um, and so like, but eventually we made headway and we started getting referrals and she was able to vouch for us, right. To other people, they'd say, I don't know if I could trust that person, but because they had trust in her, they then kind of sort of trusted us, but, um, it is hard. And I think that we could definitely put together, um, something maybe for the fall, um, mm -hmm. around, you know, engaging the chronically homeless population. So I, I, I from getting jumped in, I'll say my joke I like to make. Um, and my, it's been many years now since I started working with the chronically homeless. Now, and I have a lived experience, not, I wasn't chronically homeless. And I would say that I was more, it was a chosen lifestyle because of my past and the choices I made. Um, but I always had one alternative, my mom, which I hid from, but that's different. It's a different mindset, right? Um, but the one thing that is um, been uh, common when I speak to those who have opened up with me and that is that when they are out there in their homelessness um they are treated as if they are not capable of doing certain tasks or be being held to a standard of just general manners or, or or common sense or whatever it might be and so that a lot of them have fallen into acting out like a child would do because of the the responses they have had. I mean, I've had them tell me, if you see me having a mess around my, my myself, you know, or where I'm sitting or camping, please don't, without degrading me, please tell me, hey, would you please, would you mind, you know, picking up your trash? And maybe if you could, would you help these people to, to find their trash can, you know, things like that and not letting it go to a place. And that's what's hard is that not letting it go to a different place of, 
uh, you know, it, so many other things, you know, I don't know how to explain it, but th that's just an example. And uh, one of my first interactions with uh, someone at the shelter I was working at, I said to him, I had, had gotten to know him for a while, and he was kind of a troubled uh, younger fellow um, who was very violent. His a violent history with clients and the in the people at the shelter. That's and he wasn't allowed into the shelter to stay anymore. But we would feed him. Um, and I saw him, and he had been hadn't been around for a while. He lost an extremely large amount of weight. He looked really skinny. And um, I was talking to him. I said, "Can I get you something to eat, please? It looks like you've lost some weight. You really look like you're you you know you could you're hungry or something. Can I get you something and maybe a, a lunch for when you go?" And he was pissed. He was pissed and he, he, he wanted to start yelling. I said, well, well, you, if you, if I offended you, please just talk to me and tell me what it is and how, so I can learn not to do that. Cause I've never wanted to offend you. He says, right. now you're talking about the way I look. I can't even get a shower. And he wasn't, didn't look dirty, but it just made me realize that those are the part of th or certain things that they're living with every day. Oh, I look skinny. And he was, you know, a young chap. So he was probably, you know, in the insecurity of wanting to look good to the girls anyway, you know, but, um, and that's, but I could see it triggered him and wanting to be aggressive towards me. And I somehow talked him down from that, but it was very difficult, but it was a, it was a lesson to be learned, you know, because of what we say, I try not to say those in them when I'm speaking about the homeless, but it's sometimes hard because that's not all that they are, you know? So I'm, I just would like to see some research on it, you know, and I don't know if we'll ever quite get it, but I think that with a group, we can work towards it. And we're going to have to get beat down just as much as they have probably. <laughs> you know, so that, that's something I'd like to see. Thank you. I appreciate that feedback yeah. and sharing your experience as well. I think that's helpful. Angela? Uh, you... Oh, okay. no, no. I'm lowering I oh, uh, Julia, to lower my Julia. Hand. It's Julia that wants to talk. Yeah, Julia. Mm -hmm. You should be able to talk now, hon. Okay. And I'm like, oh, I can't find a place to unmute. <laughs> it's okay. Me too. Yeah. No, I just wanted to point out, and I know like, um, you know, in Washington, we've, and it's probably more than just Washington, but the biggest struggle we have is there's like some serious barriers that we have not found a way to bridge. We find ways, ways to bridge them. And then it's become so temporary. Like you find somebody and you start working with them and you get trust, right? And the FCS has been really good at helping people get, you know, to a point where, you know, we can help them with a moving cost to get someplace, but maybe, you know, and I'm a SOAR navigator too. So I work with them. I do oh, FCS. You're and to me. I love SOAR. I taught <laughs> SOAR in New Jersey. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So I'm our local lead. So I find that, you know, the SOAR and the FCS really work well together yeah. because you can do that. Now, as we know, especially right now after COVID, like social security, they're so backed up. It takes so long. So we have gaps, like people won't take them because yeah, okay. You can pay for their help with their moving, but what are they going to do after that? Right. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, like our, our, um, criteria for considering someone homeless to get onto like coordinated entry, things like that are ridiculous. You know, somebody has to be literally homeless living in their car. And we, so if you think about the preventative side, maybe somebody's in transitional housing, we want to move them forward. Like there's different areas and different things that we can't access for them right. because of the criteria to be homeless and it's different for different things like I wish they could all have the SOAR model for being homeless right yeah, <laughs> because yeah. that really covers all of it because someone can be homeless but if but they're couch surfing well they've been Absolutely. lucky enough to have friends and things like that and they've done that for years yeah. right that always will come to an end but to get somebody on coordinated entry which opens doors for them they don't qualify for it and I'm taking this down as notes because we meet with we meet with folks in Washington. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what their decision level, you know, like what kind of decisions they make or whatever. But um, we'll definitely pass that on as a, as well. That you know, there's a lot of doors shut unless an individual you know meets this really finite definition of homeless. Mm -hmm. um, had the same struggles here in New Jersey too. And um, it put providers 
in sometimes some unethical positions. <laughs> I'm just going to it, say of like it fudging, does right of fudging mm -hmm. like that provider that I told you about. Poor woman, right? She ran. She was a pastor and ran a, a Christian organization. I'd be like, like, could you give me this document that says this person was in your facility? <laughs> like, I, I mean, like the things that you would have to do to access help for people. Yes, and you know, I, I have recourses abuse of the system. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this for like almost about almost six years and I have recovery housing and stuff too that I oversee so it's yeah. like and it is like sometimes they ask well can you like say that they moved in just yesterday rather mm -hmm. than like last month right because they we actually let them move in without their funding to get them off the street now since they moved in they they're going to cancel their funding that they've already been approved for so it's just I think there's just you know we have to just keep advocating for that and I think like it's it that's what it's going to take. We need to just get really loud about it because I think the people that are creating the regulations are not people who have ever um, had to access the services. I myself, I was out there for over ten years in the streets, right? So I know what it's like for that whole transition, and my heart really goes out there. But my hands get tied so often. Yeah. Um, there's a website, I don't know if you're aware of it, um, for everyone, it's called the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. I'm going to put it in the chat. Um, and I'm putting that in the chat because they do a lot of research around homelessness and, and um, you know, mitigation uh, interventions like supportive housing and things like that. And that might be a really good place to get your voice heard at a more national level. Um, yeah. Because also remember that all of this rolls down from pretty much housing and urban development. Um, and that's where it starts. There's, that's where the biggest problems lie, yeah, their yeah. regulations that they set. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. So my big goal has always been to work for HUD and make changes for the people that we serve. Right. Amen. <laughs> but I'm a little too old, I think, and I don't think I would um, have the patience for it anymore. But yeah, <laughs> right. Advocacy needs to be, though. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for contributing. Um, if there is there anything else that folks want to say? So we have taken down some notes on um the request there andrea got yours um and i definitely took notes on oh the yep i will the link for the behavioral tailoring for medication resource that will actually be in the imr illness management and recovery manual so it's a part of that just answering some questions in chat so um if there are no other questions, we're going to go ahead and end and we will see you all in August. Sorry, summertime. I never know what month we're in. Thank you all. Take care. Thank Take you, care, everybody.